people will say it's all about glorifying God. We must glorify God in everything we do. That is the number one purpose of all who are Christian believers, to glorify God, to bring glory to Him. And I agree, but I don't agree on how that glory is brought to Him. Because what's implied in that is that basically God is up there in His heavens saying, I am glorious, and you will tell people how glorious I am or perish. That is what this is about. Make sure you magnify me. You tell everyone how great I am. And again, I agree in general, but not in how they actually carry that out. Because it's a question of what's more glorious. That God is this great God who created everything. And he is all and has all power. Or that knowing this, that that God, who is that one who created everything, subdued himself and became a man and made everything about you and has always made everything about you. And he was willing to take thousands of years to go through all kinds of other things and to be misunderstood knowing he would be misunderstood and, and let people think that was all about this religious type glorification of God just so that some who really want him would really see that he has always made it about us. Is that more glorious than the religious version? I believe it is. And here is a little clue to that. There's an argument going on, or has been going on a long time, about the person of Jesus. Who is Jesus? The most common one is, is that he is all God, or he is one of the people of God. That's a common one. Another one that's really popping up now, it's strange to me, is that he's not only not God, he's not even divine. He is the human son of God. And there's different variations on that. But when you look at what he said, what he did and what he said, and specifically when he said, not my will, but thine be done. Now, you have a huge problem there if he's not God. That says that one of the people of God has a different will than another person of God. That they are not unified in their will. They, I, I use that, I just hate saying that because there is no they, but I'm just playing devil's advocate for the purposes of the argument, or trying to appeal to people who believe that. How can you reconcile that? That one God person has a different will than another God person. I don't want to say, well, it was his fleshy, his flesh, it was his flesh itself. And again, I partially agree on that, but before I move on to explain Take on the other one, just because it seems to be becoming more popular, I want to address it, people that say, he's not God. Well, I understand them to believe that he's our Savior, so that means our Savior is against the will of God. Our Savior does not want us to be saved by giving his life for us. He disagrees with God. He goes along with God, but he still has this will that does not agree with God. Okay. There's the two most common ones that I, can, that I can surmise from it. So this is how I gain understanding of it. And it goes to that whole reality that we believe here. My wife and I believe that God does make it all about us. Because what he was saying was that I understand. I'm talking about his phrase, not my will, but thine be done. He was telling us that you who understand who I am, you know that I am the living God who came in the flesh. It's me. You see a man, but the one who lives within this man is the living God, the eternal God. You who understand that. So he's talking to those people when he's saying this. And he's saying, and as a man... I don't want to do the right thing. That's what he's saying. For we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. 
That's who our God is. He's someone who's willing to be misunderstood so that those who really want to see him can understand, can find that, can find that beautiful message, that nugget in there. I'm telling you, I understand. I know it's not your will. It's my will. And that's why I'm doing it. And that's why I'm going to overcome this flesh that I am occupying. And it's a mystery, understand that, that God can become a man. That is a mystery. But the mystery is not in trying to figure out the details or any of that. The mystery is trying to find out the depth of the love of the one who would do that. He's not just anyone. He's the one, the creator of all things made a decision, not only that you would exist, but that he would exist and be like you, become like you, so that he could understand you fully, not just intellectually, but really understand you and know the things that you have felt. So he is speaking as a man when he said that, not my will. So he's, he's illustrating that he knows we have this in us, and we want... His will to be accomplished at the same time. So we struggle. And Paul talked about this in Romans chapter 7. This inner man. And it's, it's beautiful what's happening. And he is going to win in this. Obviously. But I just wanted to share that with you. So you would know that there is not two wills. There is not two people. There is one God showing us how much he loves us. And prioritizing us. Making it all about us. Which, when you see that clearly, in turn, causes you to make it about Him. Because it's only in your best interest. The Creator of the universe who made it about me is someone that I should focus on. That simply makes sense. And it's not a matter of doing it perfectly. It's just a matter of seeing that more clearly every day. That when He said, not my will, He was just saying, I know. I know it's not your will. But I'll change that if you'll just trust me. If you believe in me and who I am. Because it was him. It was our one and true living God. That did that. He really did that for you. He made it about you. By diminishing himself. Willingly. Now that's power. <laughs> that's true power. That's the greatest power of all. The power of that act of love. In Jesus name. Amen.